trigger warning. We're going to talk about Dave Sims' latest work today. He gives equal weight to Judaism, Christianity, and Islam in his extremely devout religious observance, which, coupled with his political opposition to feminism, has made him the object of multiple online mobbings since 1994. Boom! Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Jim Rugg. I'm Ed Piscor. And we are poking the bear today, Ed. <laughs> <laughs> Looking at Dave Sims' upcoming Strange Death of Alex Raymond graphic novel out later this year. Before we dive into that, let's look at your book out later this week. Let's continue to poke bears, man, <laughs> uh, with a little bit of uh, carnography as it was put toward the great Dave Morrell's first blood novel. Murder on the Dark Web. For fun and profit, kayfabers, I have to thank you. Peach Momoko, I have to thank you. And Jim Rugg, my cartoonist kayfabe brother at arms, I have to thank you. Uh, this comic is a bona fide hit. One of the uh, best-selling Fantagraphics comics that has ever uh, existed. And uh, the way it works is stores are our customer. So we sold a zillion of them, but it means nothing to me if customers don't buy the thing, man. So go to your local comic shop. Pick up the comic, 64-page uh, first issue. It's a completely self-contained story, so if you dig it, uh, get it put on the pull list, man, because we're taking pre-orders right now for issue number two of uh, of Red Room, the Anti-Social Network. In this issue, the all-poker-face issue. Uh, we have uh, the pre-orders going for issues three and four as well. Like I said, all completely self-contained, modern-day horror comics, using the dark web as the MacGuffin to tell our stories. Uh, you can hit my link tree in the description below this video to put in your pre-orders with Fantagraphics. Go to your local comic shop, get it put on your pull list, and if you want to read it ahead of time, hit up my Patreon, patreon.com slash edpiscor. Three bucks get you the archive, and uh, there are three issues up there as we speak. You can join me on patreon.com slash jimrug, where you can see a sample of my weird-ass comics and how I make them, this being the world's first Blacklight comic from last year's Kickstarter, Deadly Scroll Live, Street Angel, image collection that's available now wherever comics are bought and sold, and notebook pen drawings. Some of my out-of-print zines, hard-to-find uh, mini-comics, things of that nature are available on my Patreon for download if you miss the hard copies, which in some cases with mini-comics and zines, hard to come by. And I uh, I mentioned sort of the, uh, the weirder comics that I like to make. Yes. Because it ties in very closely with the book we're going to be looking at today, Ed. So join me on patreon.com slash... Jim Rugg, where you can see how I make comics and the weird stuff that I like to make. All right, Ed. Strange Death of Alex Raymond by Dave Sim and Carson Rubaugh, who came on as kind of a, an assistant and ultimately ends up finishing what the book will be uh, after Dave Sim has a wrist injury that pretty much keeps him from drawing and, and finishing this epic. But it begins in Glamourpuss mm -hmm. in 2008, uh, Dave Sim's follow-up series to Cerebus, his self-published 300-issue limited series and uh early uh long before cerebus finishes he's talking about what he would like to do next yes. and one of those ideas is this kind of learn how to draw with a brush photo realism he refers to it as um basically copying things like al williamson i think is is a guy that he points to early on this is years before he gets to actually doing this and starts investigating where that style originates which is alex raymond and so glamour puss is just this starts as a light and fluffy fashion kind of thing where he's copying models from magazines mostly to work on learning this photorealism and how to ink with a brush and it morphs into really a history of that and so the way i got sucked into this is comics history yeah. that's the way i would describe this it's a lot more than just that it's a really <laughs> strange bit of storytelling which again sucks me into it but the starting point and the easy access point and way to describe this, I would say, is comics history centered around, you know, Alex Raymond and his peers and where that style develops from and who that style then influences as comics continue to go forward. And honestly, Alex Raymond, uh, Milk Kniff, Hal Foster, these are giants of comics, but they're not comics that I grew up reading. Right. You know, so that's the other piece. It's much easier for me to get into the history aspect when it's presented as a comic and you're kind of seeing these as characters, these, these different cartoonists, and that's what this does. And that's what we're going to try to preview and get into here, Ed, on today's episode. What but are we looking at here? This is a, it's called California Test Market Edition. This is volume one. Originally, IDW was going to publish The Strange Death of Alex Raymond. 
and I guess it was going to be a series of volumes of graphic novels. You know, this is about 100 pages, 120 pages, something like that. There's a second volume, and I don't know how many volumes were planned. There's basically two and a half volumes that are all coming out in one big collected book, so about 300 pages that document the story as much as they were able to tell of it. Uh, so this is their first run. And one of the noteworthy parts is because of the emphasis on things like line weight and detail, which again is what I enjoy, but it's really the stranger part of this. They talk about the printing and production values of uh, what they've, they've come up with and something that really couldn't be done historically. A yes. lot of these cartoonists, the reproductions just butchered these fine lines. And, and there are quotes in here of like uh, one from Neil Adams where he talks about the fine lines. Those were for him. And right. we've talked about it even in comic books of the 80s where it's like Art Adams line work. It just doesn't reproduce using those printing techniques. So part of the reason that they did this California print edition, I believe, is to kind of showcase this and, and let people see like this is what this book is going to look like. Yeah. Because these fine lines and reproduction, it's rare that a book is, is produced at this level, a comic book. I just sent off a piece of artwork for a uh, couple of shows that are happening in uh in, in chicago uh starting this summer going into october uh and it's about uh chicago's important role in the history of of comics so chris ware's doing a show at one venue uh covering like 1900 to like 1959 or something dan nadell was uh doing the other show that i'm a part of from 1960 forward and uh the piece that i sent off was uh written by Jay Lynch, Chicago cartoonist, one of the great underground guys. And he and Robert Crumb went to go visit Chester Gold, the creator of Dick Tracy, up in the Chicago Tribune, you know, penthouse office, corner window joint where Chester Gold would uh, come into town and work on his stuff. And there's bits in there about how, uh, like, they, they come to visit him, bring their sketchbooks. And he uh, responds to all their hatching and stuff. And it's like, I used to do hatching, but now it's it's all worms. It's all worms. You have to open the lines up. Like, they get squiggly. Uh, so that comes to mind. That's uh, when amazing. We, when we think about uh, just the weird uh, kind of printing technology, the fact that these strips would get shrunk down more and more as as, as time would go by to try to create more value to the reader or whatever. Um, so... The details had to go away. Uh, I'm a big fan of all the strips that we'll be talking about. I, I've got the reprints of all that stuff, and I've been in, interested in, in comic strips forever. So it's like I got the Rip Kirby's, I got uh, Steve Canyons, and all the Terry and the Pirates from IDW. You know, like before that, it was my shitty NBMs. Right. And let me tell you something: those NBMs. It's all worms. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, that was one of the things that sucked me into this Glamour Puss story to begin with. Because if you're looking here, Dave Sim is reproducing as close as he can panels yeah. from these different artists in an attempt to learn this technique and to study and understand it. And one of the things that, you know, this is, I think, issue five, issue four. The first four issues are talking mostly about reproduction mm -hmm. and how they're able to do these marks in this different style that's developing this photorealistic style. In Alex Raymond's case, done with a brush. But it allowed him, he developed a technique that allowed him to do these really fine lines. But the challenge then is how does that reproduce? And it reproduces terribly. What happens, this is an example, he has this cross hatching on Rip Kirby's leg here and Whenever it's reproduced, it's basically just black. Yeah. You know, you see these super fine lines. Again, this is a Dave Sim reproduction, but whenever it's printed, the engravers or the printers, they overexpose that, and you end up with a very heavy line. And so that was a challenge. If you're doing this technique, this painstaking technique of fine line work, and then it's all lost in the actual printing, what do you do? It's totally frustrating. And so one of the things that uh, Sim points to as Alex Raymond developing is he would put these, what he called Nightingale lines and uh, Nightingale pattern and test. That was this very fine brush stroke cross hatching. He would put it in front of visual information. And, you know, in this case, this was early experimentation where it's in front of a curtain, but if the engravers overexposed that made it too dark, that information would wash out. And so he started to do that on faces because then they really could not make it too dark 
without losing the face. And so you would see these unusual lighting things throughout uh, the later run of Alex Raymond's Rip Kirby strip. And Sim speculates that that is designed to keep the the print result the way he wants it as much as possible. A lot of a lot of uh, speculation, like uh, no doubt that, about that's, it. That's the that's the right word to use. Uh, when I was when I was a kid, I almost want to read every book I ever read, and I'm talking about prose books, because in my youthful naivete, I always assumed that the person writing the book is is a. Um, what would you call it, uh, 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 is is the authority on the subject matter. And I just like took what they said for gospel. But now, I, I wouldn't say I'm a more jaded person, but I'm certainly a more critical thinker. And there are parts in this book, uh, y- you almost have to ready your criti- critical thinking whenever you see the words clearly, <laughs> obviously, <laughs> And uh, a couple other ones, yes, because it's that's just not the case, you know. Like this is called the strange death of Alex Raymond. Alex Raymond died in this car crash, and it was uh, sort of when, when investigations were done or whatever. The idea is that you know he stepped on he stepped on the gas when he should have stepped on the brake. Uh, but clearly, you know he's a he's a sports car enthusiast. He he would know which is which. There's a whole episode of Malcolm Gladwell's uh, revisionist history about this exact phenomenon, and that's just that's just not the case. Sometimes, if you're not and and by the way, it was not his car, so that's all the pieces that go into S- S- Stan Drake's car. Yeah, that's all the pieces that go into the revisionist history episode where people get these rental cars and they even play a nine one one call. Uh, I don't know if you heard this episode. They even play a 911 call, and it's a guy and his family, and he's like, he's like, I'm 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 stepping on the brake, but the car keeps accelerating, and you hear it, like it's like you're not stepping on the brake, you fuck, you yeah. just want to shake him, and it the, the end results were terrible, uh, uh, com- completely fatal, and uh, and that and that's what happened to him, you know, but but Sim is really going in deep has no editor so we're reading his thoughts on the subject and uh you know he he goes all over the place in a very beautiful manner that's the other part that's very easy to get sucked into this like look at the the raindrops on the windshield and the windshield wiper wiping those away so Mm -hmm. they're not everywhere it's it's a very beautifully drawn book which makes it very easy to get sucked in but yeah let's let's give the overview of the story two two big pieces of this story one is Alex Raymond dies in a car accident behind the wheel of Stan Drake's new Corvette. Yeah. Uh, Dave Sim looks at this through several different lenses. It reminds me a little bit of the way Alan Moore gets into From Hell, where it's like, let's look at all the information that we can gather up and try to build a story around that. And so in doing that, we are exposed to, like, there are a couple of chapters in this first book. One of them is a, they're, they're accounts from different places, and he cites where those accounts are coming from and who is telling the stories. Some of them are, are public record, newspaper articles about his death. One is that he runs into a tree and they die. Yeah. One is that he runs into a stone wall and they die. Yeah. One is that the windshield fractures and a blade of a shard of glass goes through his mouth and out the back of his head. And like these are all accounts that you can find in print, yeah. on the record, so to speak, and they're vastly different and it's like it's like why are there these different accounts so that's one vein that he looks at the other one gets into this metaphysical department of uh the author of gone with the wind margaret mitchell this story is somewhat incomplete even the book that's going to come out so i don't know exactly where he was going with this but i think there's as i was reading it it felt like speculation that alex raymond was trying to maybe murder stan drake because stan drake picks up Alex Raymond's style and elevates it to the next level. He's the next guy in this photorealism chain. And also he gets this comic strip, The Heart of Juliet Jones, that was allegedly developed by Margaret Mitchell of Gone with the Wind fame. And it's something that Alex Raymond would have wanted. And Stan Drake got it. So, and it's the biggest launch of King Features. Sir, going past Rip Kirby that had been the biggest launch a few years earlier. So there's all this different stuff. And a lot of the Margaret Mitchell stuff is what this 
volume fo what what this book focuses on is just like how she is connected to all these different tangents of stories of models that are used by the different cartoonists that were doing photorealism and used models and used polaroids so it's very strange the threads that he's weaving together and that is part of the appeal of this book for me because i've never read anything like this when we were talking about it ed i said you know it's like neuropathways, it's almost like you're riding a Dave Sim neuropathway through this thought process. Yes, and, and Dave Sim, uh, to, to, to my mind, is not uh, far from like a Henry Darger kind of, kind of guy. We don't have... There's no editor in, around Dave Sim. We, we don't have the, you know, 15-volume, 1,000-page books of Henry Darger's Vivian Girls, but we have 6,000 pages of art, comics about an aardvark that were put out <laughs> on, on a monthly basis. So this is... This is a different kind of uh, thought process than than the average bear. The co the um, comic history stuff in here, I really like, and I think he he puts a good uh, a good good he he has interesting thoughts, uh, good thoughts about uh, some of the things that like as a fan of comic strips that I sort of seen certain connections, but I never dug deep into the specific yes. history. So I'm talking about like the milk Kniff you know, cartoon realism, and there's even, it's almost like bits of, like, the Scott McCloud tri pyramid matrix of... Yes. Except, except zooming in closely at these, like, photorealist guys, and there's, like, you know, photorealist, car cartoony, photorealistic, you know, like, how Foster, like, no frills, completely accurate, and then somewhere in between, and then he, he puts all of those guys on a matrix. Yeah, you see in this spread, Wally Wood talking about Stan Drake, talking about technique. One of the great things with all of these cartoonists is we have interviews with them from fandom to, you know, the comics journal. Yeah. And that's some of the dots that Sim is connecting where he's getting, you know, snippets, excerpts from these different artists who are weighing in on some of the other artists. And so you get things from technique ideas to who's influencing who and how they're working. Um, you know, Wally Wood, one of the guys known for things like swiping and photocopies and you know don't uh never swipe what you can trace never trace what you can photocopy these are real things that illustrators would do at the time you know like a lot of these polaroids and stuff like um one of the things stan drake and alex raymond are friendly stan drake brings him in and he's like um he's showing him the autograph so he takes a polaroid and then he can blow up that or project that polaroid right onto his page yeah. using this machine you know and it's it's not it reminded me of a magician, and it's kind of like once you see how the magician's trick is done, it's always disappointing. So yeah. I don't want to get too much into that, but that's what some of this stuff is. And if you make comics, if you're trying to do some of these things, if you're like, how on earth does Wally Wood, you know, manage lines like that, or Al Williamson, or whoever is your guy, you know, with this technique, it's incredible to see some of the process and, and how some of these tricks are achieved um, from an application standpoint. It's interesting because. All of the stories in Glamour Puss are redone for the final version. This is almost like... I've never seen the, that Wally Wood and Hilary Hama page, and, and it's not in this. Exactly. Um, this is almost like your rough notes. This is the Dave Sim sort of rough notes of what's going to go into the revised graphic novel version of Alex Raymond, but it's fascinating. It's You're seeing the early days of research. By the time you get here, it's almost like he's completely filled his brain with everything he can about this stuff. You know, the Margaret Mitchell stuff, very small part of this, uh, a huge part here. You know, he just keeps connecting those dots out, but it never stops with references to other cartoonists and sort of how they fit on that. Scott McCloud's pyramid, the style pyramid, is a really good example because that's what he's pulling out is like, where these different styles mesh who comes out of which, you know, which versions of them. And it's well documented throughout this. I think this would be uh, an equally compelling collection because then the other part of it is the glamour post part where he's just tracing and, and inking these model photos from various fashion magazines while he's learning how to use this brush to do this style. So it's uh, it's pretty trippy. It's It's very interesting comics. And again, it feels like you're going through somebody's brain reading these things. And that's some of the most interesting part for me is just like, I haven't seen comics done in this way. In terms of comics as a language, I've never seen them applied this way. Yeah. You've, you've connected more dots for me than, than I picked up on this read because the Margaret Mitchell stuff, while it exists, 
forget about in two seconds and I'm just reading about, you know, there's this weird MacGuffin that happens with the comic shop girl that uh, seems to me unnecessary. It seems like trolling or something. Yeah, it is an odd part. It's very far removed from the Glamorpus version of this story because this character, this comic shop, none of it exists. It's almost, it's, I think it's a, an attempt at a literary device to try to contextualize this information within the direct market, I suppose. I think this is the part that Carson Grubaugh is drawing and handling for the most part. And I have a story about local heroes. Whenever I started Street Angel at Image Comics, the very first signing I did was at local heroes. So I'm reading this and I'm like, what the hell is going on here? This so is a real story. It looks exactly like this. So it's extra matter for you. Yeah, very strange. <laughs> also, this is set in Kitchener, Ontario. Local Heroes is Norfolk, Virginia. So as soon as I was reading this, and when I had my signing, this character, Jack, in this story, was the store manager. Like, this was a real person that I'm standing next to signing books or whatever, you know, like... So I'm reading this, and I'm like, this is all real stuff, <laughs> but I don't understand how it fits and why... And, it's in Kitchener, like, what are you doing? What is this? And that's how I got connected to this in that I wrote to the Carson and was like, tell me more. And I wrote to Greg, the owner of Local Heroes, and was like, do you know this is in here? And like, what's the connection? So that part is not my favorite, except that I have some connection. And it's interesting that it's somebody I know in a, in a, in a real comic book store. But it, it gives a framing device to get us into this idea of a comic book about the strange death of Alex Raymond. Yeah. Part of that metaphysical part again um i think i get a little tired of reading metaphysical in the text however that's what this is right you know it's a comic about a comic about a cartoonist you know it's it's all of these elements so it is somewhat at least uh metatextual in a lot of ways one note here dave sim used to win eisner's all the time for lettering yeah tremendous letter yeah service probably one of the best yes uh, this is mostly lettered using jo a Joe Kubert font from Comic Craft. I pointed out for a couple of reasons. One, I think Dave Sim maybe physically, um, he has wrist problems that really affect his drawing, and eventually he stops drawing because it's so painful. So I wonder if there were if that was part of it. The other part is some of the artwork from Glamour Puss is used in this collection, but it's rewritten, and so I think the lettering allowed him to maybe keep updating text as yeah. he found more information as his thoughts changed so there is a real sense of stream of consciousness and just like connecting these various images or ideas visually and it's amazing but i think the lettering this is an example of using digital lettering or mechanical lettering where it allows you to continue to edit and revise yeah and update um, and even reconfigure your pages and reuse your art and stuff so kind of interesting it, we looked at barry windsor smith's monsters recently right this masterpiece, you know, 35 years in the making kind of thing. I think you could argue that The Strange Death of Alex Raymond is the same kind of thing. It's a cartoonist that has put in his 35, 45 years and is really going for something. And uh, we learned after that Barry Windsor Smith episode that that was lettered by Barry Windsor Smith also. You know, we commented on how well the lettering sort of helps lead us through complex page layouts. This feels like the same thing, where Dave Sim is handling the lettering but it's it's done in a way that really uh it's part of the art even though it's done digitally yeah look at these great collages man it makes me wonder if while he was putting it together and you know you when you do your um like your red room variants and how, how you're trying to like match tools and stuff do you think he has uh an artograph projector <laughs> on one of these little camera arms That's right on his desk <laughs> because because i mean how else i mean we were going to do a shoot interview with Dave Sim right before uh, qu quarantine mm -hmm. happened, right? And the the way that we were going to accomplish that was he was going to be in a coffee shop. And the reason we didn't was because, obviously, lockdown's everywhere because his internet sucks and stuff. So, like, I don't see him really getting in deep with Photoshop and arranging his his uh, collages to, to then trace. Something tells me the artograph machine uh, is, is the principal production tool to achieve this stuff what's well, always these uh cross-eyed ladies man yeah you know he, he he pokes fun at the fashion stuff and uh that goes back to a quote that's um milk kniff has about alex raymond taking a year off to kind of develop this new style and that his art sort of goes into this fashion you know this fashion high-end capital a art direction and i think that's part of the the 
why why do this kind of fashion stuff and make make it light and silly? I love the promos, man. I love the promos those guys are cutting. Like in a day when comics were real business, these guys uh, were competition, <clears throat> and the the fight and the struggle with style and taking other dudes' techniques. Can't stop thinking about hip hop in that regard, man. Like you know, DJs protecting their records and and uh, always calling people out for biting their style. Like, there's going to be examples here where Dave Sim is, is talking about the, the Milk Kniff drapery style and how it's uh, it's par- perfectly coordinated sets of messy marks. And then when Alex Raymond does it, haphazard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This Okay, back to the comics history stuff. You see... Half hour in. Al Williamson. Yeah. John Prentice. This is the artist who took over after Alex Raymond died, took over Rip Kirby, um, you know, after after the car accident. And these are quotes from, you know, these guys, whether it's talking about technique, tools, or just giving context as to where they are. You know, Al Williamson, sort of a um, student of Alex Raymond. Yeah. So lots of connections there. The reproduced, um, you know, this book is mostly reproduced comic strips and panels, which... Reproduced meaning he traces them and stuff. Right, right. Trying to approximate techniques and tools and, and, I don't know, getting into the headspace of how these were made. As the book progresses, he starts to pull panels out where he's now making narratives out of linking different panels together right. and connecting it with some of the Margaret Mitchell stuff, some of the behind the scenes stuff. Um, you know, Stan Drake married three times, so there's some stories there that are a little bit salacious that, that we get into with uh, affairs with models and things like that along the way, overlapping models um, between different artists at the time because they all hip- live in Connecticut. They're that, all in the same town. That's in hip hop too, man. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, Busta Rhymes' uh, baby mama might be Usher's baby mama. It's it's wild stuff. S- spent hours making a door jam look like a door jam. Sp- yeah, Stan Drake once put it, quote, spending all morning making a door jam look like a door jam. And who knew that a door jam had a B at the end? And this sequence is you see the Charles Schultz Peanuts version of Dave Sim. Now we're going Bob Sikoriak. Yes, and also uh, critical uh, critical of Charles Schultz and the impact he had on photorealism and reproduction because, in his words, you could have photocopy after photocopy after photocopy of Peanuts and it still looks fine, and, oh. it, and it ruined the engravers because it's fine. It doesn't have to be perfect. That's just no good for photorealism. Most popular strip at the time, uh, all that stuff you said earlier about you know, the worms and showing off those rip curvy panels. It's all because of peanuts. <laughs> this is really like, uh, this is, this is Dave Sim, like meditating with himself and uh, in, in, in a, a lot of ways, you know what I'm saying? Like t- talking that kind of stuff because it is all conjecture, but he'll have, he'll have these quotes that can support stuff. But once again, uh, when we get into the obvious lees and the clear lees, that's him putting his, his own thoughts onto the thing and it's not necessarily the fact of the matter this is him talking about that style both speculating on how it's done and whether you know he could ever do something like that and even at this point like you know that he could never uh, he would never learn to ink with the level of brilliant simplicity or ever be capable of just slapping wide spontaneous brush strokes onto the artboard as raymond had done in this drawing and those wide brush strokes you can see in like the stripes of her clothing. Like literally it's just one dash off very quick organic brush stroke to create that pattern. So you're seeing what he's talking about and then him recreating it. It's just strange. But then he, but then we're going to get to the part, my favorite part. And I bet it's your favorite part too, when, where he cracks the code. Yes. And then, <laughs> I have a post on okay, that page. Good, good. And then, and then his, his own inking levels up. So it's, there's that middle period of Alex Raymond where he's struggling to try to bring in a little mm-hmm. KNF and stuff like this. So we just saw Dave Sim struggle. That's the meta. Some of the metaphysical stuff isn't what he's calling metaphysical. It's what we're seeing on the page. Yes. Yeah, totally. Most of it. Yeah. <laughs> I love this stuff, man. And we yeah. might, we might, we might dash it. We might actually accidentally blow by it. So I just want to call it out right here. He cites, quote, see you in the funny pages as being a new Adams quote. And who knew, you know, like even that is like, you know, maybe, maybe that was a thing, but it's such a popular quote. I, I would feel like the salesman at new Adams uh, is, I would feel like he would have a shirt 
with Continuity Studios logo <laughs> and like big quotations uh-huh. on his chest every time he goes to a convention or something, man. So uh, I am curious about that. Yeah. Yeah, that's good stuff. There's a couple quotes like that, like uh, the brush is a lazy tool that's right. attributed to Neil Adams, but uh, Sim can't actually cite it. And, and he says that, you know, he says like this is attributed there, but he's not positive that, that he ever actually said that. Uh, this is uh, describing the Rip Kirby, Alex Raymond style versus say Flash Gordon, you know, Neil Adams talking about whatever happened to Flash Gordon, Flash Gordon being Alex Raymond's coming out party, like where he really became spectacularly known and then went off to the war. And when he came back, did not get the strip back. Uh, at that point, he refines his style and he comes up with Rip Kirby, but it's a different style. And Neil Adams is, is and several people sort of, Eh, you might like Flash Gordon more than Rip Kirby. It's a very popular strip historically. Yeah. And so that's alluded to, and specifically the style change here from, um, this is Stephen Beaker in his book, Comic Art in America, describes Rip Kirby's style as something modern and almost too intellectual. And this is getting into both fashion and art. And that runs through here, you know, this, again, speculation of Alex Raymond thinking of the comic strip as art or how it could be art. This was an example of Sim trying to figure out the inking style and how frustrated he was by this heavily rendered style. And when he got to the pants and belt, he just dashed them off with a brush, fat, you know, Alex Raymond style brush and says it's like one of the best things he's ever drawn. So there are these moments of him breaking through stylistically. And then we get to see that heavy brush style of Alex Raymond, where it's like pull out a bunch of these panels and then talk about that style going back to Milt Kniff. Yeah. And uh, this is even talk about inside baseball the Milt Kniff uh, School, um, sometimes known as the Sickles School. To Milt, the, to Milt the Sickles, heads. yes, who worked closely with Milt Kniff. They were peers. They, they were both out of Cleveland, uh, shared studio space together. A lot of speculation on how involved No Sickles was in maybe ghosting a little bit, helping out here and there. So it's a high level of like inside baseball that you're getting here. These three gentlemen right here, uh, thinking about the workload thinking about the aesthetics of those strips it's an insane level of production day in day out take a look at a terry and the pirate strip whenever kniff was cooking uh the how foster stuff i think fantagraphics has like a artist edition every panel was basically an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper yeah so there's he's drawn one panel a day and that's probably taken 10 hours Get meticulous attention to things like anatomy and detail. Yeah, all the perspective. It's it's all illustratively correct. No no shorts. Uh, amazing. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. These are great. This is the Milk Kniff quote about Raymond. Raymond had taken a year or so off to develop that style of his, real fashion plate stuff. And some of this is is emphasized through bold face and italicized font, and emphasis Dave Sims. So as you're reading this, it really is like Dave Sims interpretation of all of this history, but there is the history is there, you know, maybe the emphasis on certain words aren't right, but the, the history part, you know, like he's cites where those are coming from. Go back one real quick, man, <laughs> because now we, we got our, uh, like, when you see this, it's like, yeah, it looks Eisnerish, And now we have our like fourth wall piece has just come in. I, di- I didn't queue up a Will Eisner or splash effect or something. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Arguing with himself over the script. <laughs> All right. This is what I was talking about with the stone wall. The first version of this cover was the tree. Now we're getting into the stone wall and it's like he fixates, Sim fixates on this. Why is this detail different? Yes. Yes. Why, why would this account be different? And, you know, gets into who actually delivers this account and what his relationship is. And it's like the, this guy was at King Features forever, knew Alex Raymond very, very well. Uh, it doesn't make sense that there are these different accounts of this accident, at yeah. least to Dave Sim. It's, uh, uh, you mix a little Ra- Rashomon with a little uh, Errol Morris's uh, thin blue line, you know, like where there's those reenactments and, uh, you know, put in a little Dave Sim mania and... You have this comic. There's even the part where uh, Drake talks about getting his ear ripped off in interviews mm-hmm. and stuff. And then Dave Sim, like, researches ear microsurgery. Yes. And discovers that 
that that was a uh, you know the first surgery was done like many years afterward or something so it would be impossible for his ear to have been re- because he would have been the first uh, test case <laughs> right you know like it, it, even 10 years after it was done they they performed it correctly on the first rat or some shit we talk so much about wrestling you know parallels with wrestling this feels like it where like all of these guys are just putting out those stories. You sure. know, it's almost like you're just crafting your own story, your own mythology. And of course they do. They sit in a room all day and tell stories when it comes to an interview. Of course they're going to be in that storyteller mode. It always works that way. And, and first off, these guys are professional storytellers, so they're going to give you the good version. It, it reminds me like when I was reading this, uh, the first thing I think of is, is fake news or the state of journalism or something. And it just makes me think like, We've had articles written about ourselves. There's always inaccuracies, and I don't think anybody has any ulterior motives for it. That's just the way it works. There are details that we know, so, you know, the journalists just, they're little details. You know, it it seems like no crime is committed, no malice is intended. It just happens, but it always happens, and I think it's always been that way. I think it's inevitable. It's the same with, like, people that observe an accident. You always hear about eyewitnesses are unreliable, and... You know, whether it's in court or to a reporter, the the accounts are going to vary. Even if we all stand on the sidewalk and watch the same car accident, we'll all have different versions of what we just saw. Jimmy, I I witnessed a shot. I witnessed a gun murder, and I was with two friends. And when we all uh, reconvened, one person saw a love triangle that I did not see happen before. Like our stories were so right. different, completely different. Yeah, I, I think it's just, uh, it's just, it's life, really. You know, like, we're all living this version of reality. We think we live in the same planet, and yet it's completely different from person to person. And I think that's what this all is, in a lot of ways. And, and this happens to be Dave Sims' version of this. But it's very entertaining, because he has this craft level that allows him to do a graphic novel that is stuff I've never seen before. I've been lingering on this page just to say, like, comparing uh, what Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle were to philosophy... Foster, Kniff, and Raymond were too realistic comic art. That's the, that's what you would say, like on the on the lectern at like the Eisner Awards, what you're talking about those dudes. Like, that's a good piece right there, man. The foundation for all that comes after Ed. Yeah, here Kirby, you know, this you know, is who, who great are you stuff. looking at? Like uh, he he talks about Foster and Kniff and those guys. Yeah. So how Foster school? What the uh, what the you know non stylized realism talks about some of the, the characteristics of Hal Foster and his version of this, and then noted comic book practitioners that allow Kirby to go in there and and recreate now, or I mean allow Sim to go and recreate now more and more comic book styles. Rockwell font. <laughs> Alex Raymond school, same deal. Like who is practicing this? You know, I mentioned Al Williamson before. Frazetta has some really cool recreations and, and talk about the fine lines that would not be reproduced by the printing techniques at the time. You could see, you could see it in the... That was why the EC hardcovers are printed oversized from the direct, like, plates and stuff, yes. man, because uh, the fans wanted to try to capture those incredible details that Al Williamson and Frazetta put into those, like, sci-fi strips, for instance. Milk Kniff School... Jack Kirby and Joe Simon coming out of that. Joe Kubert and Will Eisner coming out of that. The messy guys. Fascinating. The guys with the organic lines. You know, we all talk about everything going back to guys like Will Eisner or uh, Jack Kirby. Um, This is where they go back to. You know, this is is who they aspire to, where they learned a lot of the things that they would then put on the pages. Bela Lugosi from Ed Wood uh, goes back to the (laughs) Kniff school. (laughs) this this piece right here. This whole spread is this shit, man. Sim doing a whole litany of styles and eras here on these two pages. And this is what this story really becomes. It's like just panel after panel of different artists, different styles, and then almost like Chip Kid reassembling panels into a new narrative. That's what we devolve into. You know something cr- crazy, though? Like, and see, this this is like one of those things, man. He talks about Bruce Tim. It's Michael Avon Oming, man. That's Powers. So, you know? Yeah. Yeah, there there are... Shouts to Mike. He's a kayfaber. <laughs> there are pieces that maybe don't line up perfectly. But it's fucking Dave Sim doing Jim Lee. Yeah. Or uh, Michael Turner. Oh, is that who it's supposed to be? It doesn't list who that is. I was looking at it and trying to speculate. It's that... It, it is, I think, a Wild Storm style. Um, 
but it's 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 weird, you know. Like this is one of those. I think he spent a lot more time thinking about Alex Raymond than he did thinking about Jim Lee or, you know, whatever style exactly he's lifting there. You know what? You and I can do the book about Scott Williams and <laughs> Kink Technique yes. and then all the people that bit his style. <laughs> <laughs> Bat, we're looking at you. <laughs> Bust out those Hunt One O Twos. Oh my goodness! Pretty good art, Adams. Yeah, I like it. So I love this stuff. This is all just talking about these guys, what they were doing, how influential they are, what they are coming out of, you know, so referencing certain illustrators and, and artists that, uh, you know, Kniff, Foster, and Raymond are looking at, yeah. which is kind of cool. There's so much information. Like, it's such a dense thing. I keep saying it's like you're going through Dave Sims' brain. And, you know, for good or bad, uh, that's, that's not necessarily a place that I would want to spend too much time but it's definitely something as a reading experience that I can't point to another book and say, here you go. Um, you know, there's lots of biographies of cartoonists out there where there is speculation about how styles developed and what cartoonists, you know, motivated them to do the, make the choices they made. This one, because it's a graphic novel and because Sim is recreating panels, it really is this jarring effect of like, you're not just reading ideas or historical information about these guys. You're seeing like the panels that are referenced. Right. And it really does create a unique reading experience for me, which is the main reason I wanted to talk about this book. Um, and, and you can see as, as we go on, the pages become, I, I don't know what the right word is, more flamboyant, maybe, uh, as he's getting better and more comfortable with this style, more confident in the story he's telling, we start to see, and I do think there's some digital manipulation, Ed, because we start to see distortion of but, these strips in ways where it's like, I speculate on how he's doing some of this stuff where it's like, I'm not just now copying an Alex Raymond strip. I'm copying it as if it's like fading off into the distance or it's a weird, you know, it's off, off the corner of my desk. You, you could bend, you could bend the projector and get a skewed image. So it's very true. You could change the level of your drawing table. That's what I'm saying. And, and uh, you know, it's be able to really image. work that way. The cropping of some of this stuff, you know, as we're like zooming in on panels, it just makes for a, a wild page, right? Yeah. You know, it's, and then you drop your lettering on top to Have sort it. of really emphasize that the weird angles and perspectives that we're seeing to create a depth. You even see the shadowing, right. the cross hatching underneath some of these word boxes to further enhance that sense of 3D on the page. And I don't even know what some of the background imagery is. Some of these patterns of like, you know, I mentioned uh, neuro firing or something. There's no reference to Steve Ditko in this book, as far as I remember reading. But how appropriate would that be for some of those weird Doctor Strange realms? You know what that's like, man. That's like uh, go go watch Fight Club again and see like those that opening sequence. How it's like inside of yeah. neural pathway or exactly. something like that. It's, and it's all based on algorithms. It's it's just like a weird uh, computer thing. What we're building towards through this is the evolution of Alex Raymond over the first couple of years of Rip Kirby into like the mature style um, that, that Dave Sim feels is separate from Milk Kniff. You know, this is Alex Raymond doing some Milk Kniff on this, his way to doing Alex Raymond. This is that piece I was talking about, like the coordinated, spontaneous brush strokes, but then here's <laughs> the Alex Raymond version. It's just like a little messy. But it, by, by his light to me... I would be very happy to draw this way, but these guys are operating at a different level, man. Yeah, no doubt about it. <laughs> you know, like this is wild because that's drawn. Yeah. If, if you were if you were doing that in Photoshop, that'd be one thing. Easy to do. But to draw that, it's really a strange use of this kind of skill that you're trying to develop, and now you're applying it in these kind of distorted ways. Pretty fun. I mean, this is kind of what an artist does, right? Like, you figure out your style, your story subject, especially a comic strip, and then it's like, explore it in every direction you can think of as time permits, and I feel like that's what he's doing visually. Jimmy, we're entering another one of those uh, clearly, obviously uh, pieces, man, when, yes. when he starts breaking down this photo. This is amazing. And he becomes a body language expert. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> photo in question is... Passing on from Milk Kniff as the president of the National Cartoonist Society, I believe is what this is. Yeah. And then Alex Raymond taking over as president. And it's the analysis of the handshake. At this point in in this narrative, 
Kniff is not happy with Alex Raymond's style and how it's kind of uh, the talk of the town, if you will. You know, it's taken over as, as the most popular uh, title that Milk Kniff had for a long time. Rube Goldberg. Yeah. There's nothing really here uh, about Rube Goldberg, but in the Glamour Puss issue that covers this, it's it talks about Rube Goldberg and how he has his own dictionary entry. Like, amazing the, the scale of these guys. You know, we don't have the full book here to look at, but as they get into, like, Stan Drake's backstory, he's coming from advertising, uh, working at the biggest advertising agency at the time. He branches off into his own advertising agency. Super influential, Stan Drake. I mean, that's Neil Adams comes through that advertising agency and eventually moves to comic strips from advertising. Mm-hmm. It's like the comic strip is this apex for these kinds of illustrators. And, uh, and that's what you see here are a bunch of these dudes that are, like, alpha, at least in their field. Um, you know, these are the top of the line guys being read by tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people every day. And, uh, a lot of egos in these rooms. It's, it, that's, that's a fun context to think about it in because as you know, I've read beyond, uh, what we're going to look at here mm-hmm. and I got to, you know, the John Cullen Murphy part. So he takes over, well, he starts doing strips in the sixties or something, takes over, uh, Prince, Prince Valiant at a certain point. And illustration was uh, kind of already on the wane in mm-hmm. a way. Uh, so the comic strip was a fallback for just job security at that point. So these guys are apex level. And even John Colin Murphy is entering in a space when uh, the comic strip was kind of like an also ran, like just something to do to make sure you could put food on the table. The John Colin Murphy thing, I'm glad you mentioned, he lived in that Connecticut town where all of these uh, cartoonists lived and they would get together for barbecues on the weekends. They would golf together, compare sports cars, things of that nature. Right. John Colin Murphy's son recently wrote a, a book about that time period and growing up there. I forget his son's name, you know, last name Murphy, but the book is cartoon country and it's a serious, you know, it's, it's kind of a historical account of all of these guys living in this little, little, town of cartoonists and uh what it was like growing up there model you know everybody's modeling for each other and stuff you need a kid to to jump off of a table you know i'm I'm, let my eight-year-old son pose for your polaroid reference shot and so that's the story that he tells in this book is basically what that community was like and look what you're doing you know you're being paid very very well to draw fantasy pictures imagine what that lifestyle is where it's like that's all my neighbors too sure yeah and 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 you know, that's a wild book. We, uh, it was, it was tax season very recently. And, uh, the tax guy always says the same thing, man, you need to spend more money on your business, man, or else you're going to send this stuff to the tax man. So, uh, why not pay some models and stuff and, and, and spend some of the, your business money on your own self rather than, I'm you waiting know. for you to get the new Corvette, Ed. Yes, yeah, goddamn right. We <laughs> get 2022 Corvette. Let's compare Teslas. <laughs> hey, Jimmy, want to drive my Tesla? Let me just uh, hide these bolt cutters, these wire cutters. The better views would go up if it's pretty soon we're, we're demoing Teslas. <laughs> <laughs> Cartoonist kayfabe. Here's your story about the ears being ripped off. Both ears had been ripped off his head. And he shows it. <laughs> <laughs> With all kinds, I mean, that was a Red Room panel. All right, man, we are getting into now this Nightingale brush strokes. Oh, this is the shit. And this is where he really Bernie becomes Wrights him. Baby. Catherine Jones. There's some great stuff. Again, you know, next generation of, of kind of this realist style. And so it's it's how do they get their line work? You know, these guys that are known for their, the, these artists known for their line work, like how are they making their fine lines? How are they making, how are they controlling the brush in this way? <laughs> like DNA is part of it. <laughs> so it's so ludicrous. The famous... The famous Bernie Wrightson technique for for getting your brush to do the thing, man, is just uh, making all those like little slash marks and ro- rolling your brush on the paper. But the problem is, as Dave Sim found out, man, you get a line or two, and then the brushes unravel, they uncoil, and when you're drawing with expediency, that just ain't gonna work for an Alex Raymond, man. And God damn it, if uh, Dave Sim didn't crack the code, I feel like, man. I wanted to try this this week, and I and I didn't. I, I tried it with a Pentel brush pen, not the same. That ain't the same at all. Um, so I, I, I wish I could pull out a piece of paper and show you, like, okay, here are the lines. Uh, but 
you know, do it at home if you're watching this. I mean, these are the lines, you know? This is your demo, and this is how Dave Sim is able to create these Nightingale lines, and they're amazing looking. You know, um, I've done fine line inking with brush. It can be done. Uh, I would... I had done this technique. I love that it's so clear, like the way these two techniques are shown. If you're watching at home, like you can demonstrate, you, you can practice both of these and see what works for you. And yes, I love it. This is some of my favorite stuff. This is part of what sucked me in. When I started reading Glamour Puss, it was like a random issue I found in a quarter bin and it had this kind of information and it was like, I want more of that. Yeah. So that's kind of the rabbit hole that I went down. But you see what he's doing instead of twirling the brush. It's this sideways thing where he's creating like a chisel point. Yeah, and 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 I think is there a like he like lets a set of ink like dry on it to kind of hold the point? Is is that a part that is of the reading? idea? Uh, once this is set, once you create this, it'll hold the point for a long time. You can keep dipping. It really does. Uh, yeah, there there is like a almost a reservoir. Uh, uh, the the tackiness of the ink yeah. kind of creates and holds this form. And so you can just ink for a long time without having to recreate your point. And um, in Glamour Puss, Sim talks about there's reproduction of Alex Raymond originals, I think Rip Kirby, from Comic Art Magazine. It would have been early 2000s. And he gives that a lot of credit. And then the other thing that he cites a lot in, in here is Heritage Auction. You know, if you're a member, you can see all of the comics pages that are auctioned off at high resolution. And so that's where Dave Sim is studying these lines and trying to figure out what's happening. What am I seeing here? And so here he's pulling out that this technique for sharpening the brush, Raymond's doing it in the artwork. Right. And Sim starts to find these marks in the artwork in different places where it's like, you can see where he's sharpening his brush on the page. As opposed to, uh, you know, Bernie writes and having like a like a piece of paper, a roll of paper towels that he's running his brush across to sharpen. Alex Raymond is this is a technique built for speed. Right. I mean, the you see that crazy artwork, how the level of craft every single day. Uh, you got you got to shave shave some time off as 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 much as possible. And once again, we're playing uh, with a game that has very high stakes when these guys are becoming uber millionaires and things. So you can't even let your assistant know how you achieve that yeah, shit. Yeah, very secretive, very secretive. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. And, and he talks about that. I love this, like where he's doing the, the demo of this and, you know, writing about it. And it's upside down panels. It's distorted panels. That's really cool. And then we get into uh, this next page and talking about this kind of style and effect and other artists who are studying it. Alex Toth is one that he cites, especially like some of his early work, pre-Hollywood, he calls it. Bernie Kriegstein, who at the time of his death, there were like two, two comics collections found in his possession, and they were Alex Raymond newspaper strips. Um, Kriegstein's not a guy I would think of to connect to this style. I always think of him as a pen guy. But it's it's interesting that you know, at least he was conscious of Alex Raymond, you know, the fact that he had these collections uh, and then Frazetta, you know, taking it to, to another level, as he says, and done in perspective. <laughs> the distorted panels really amuse me because they sure. look really good. They do. Um, and they really create that 3D effect once you have like a hand or some element that's on a different plane. It's kind of depicted in that not flat way. Yeah, keeps the page interesting for sure, man. Like, and and I think that that's that's where the artistry comes in when you're playing with this kind of style because you could take a look at a lot of comics where they're tracing photos and junk, fucking super boring, very flat, super static. So he's kind of addressing some of that in his compositions. Just yeah, just from that formal, uh, you know, what what the challenge is for this story. Um, it's a pretty good example for a young cartoonist to think about, like, how do you make this stuff interesting? Because this whole page, it's the printed versions and then Sims recreations, and it's pretty interesting. Yeah. And part of that's the context of, you know, the story as a whole, but it could be done very poorly and very in a very boring kind of way. See no Adams. Ben Casey. See you in the funny papers. <laughs> That's your quote, right? My uncle used to say that all the time when I was a kid. Yeah, man, your uncle was a New Adams fan. He didn't even know it. Yeah, I didn't even know it. It was before I was reading comics, but I, it was one of those things I remember from him. I wonder if New Adams knows it. <laughs> it's a good point. And then super close-ups. Again, it calls to mind things like Chip Kid, you know, and Jeff Spears photographing these old comics uh, to really show off those kinds of fine brush strokes. Look how much it resembles a pencil tip. Right. 
Yeah, that's the other thing. When he's getting into these very fine lines and showing us like super tiny brushes, like the physics of them all work. Yeah, he refers to it throughout as the Nightingale test pattern, which is just a, a pretty simple crosshatch. But it, it does, the way this book positions it, it does seem to be the breakthrough moment for, uh, you know, for Raymond's ascension with this style. Kind of, kind of mind-blowing that that would be where any energy is applied to get pen-like strokes with a brush, right? Like, Yeah, it's it's pretty wild. Um, Dave Sim talks about how, you know, that thing of the brush being the lazy man's tool or the lazy tool and how it would be much easier, in his opinion, to do this with pen and brush combo. So, you know, maybe it shouldn't be called a lazy tool because it's it's not the easiest way to do this. Yeah. I wonder if, like, when you start to see some of these patterns, right, I wonder if if everything went properly, like, or how, how he envisioned it, like, do we get to Gerhardt, you know? Like, do, do we start do we start to take this technique and fo follow the lineage up to Gerhardt? I've read so much about this that I can't tell you exactly what parts, I'm, where I'm getting things from, so right. I don't know if it's in this book, but I, I do remember Gerhardt, like, I think they had those conversations about these cross-hatching. Going back to some of the early illustrators that were doing this technique, uh, you know, Gerhard, longtime Cerebus background artist, he and Dave Sim worked together for, geez, I don't know, 15 years or something, um, you know, in the same space. And so what are you going to talk about while you're doing cross-hatching all day long, every day for years? Uh, you know, and so I think I think the topic at least came up. I don't know whether it makes it into or would have made it into a complete version of this story or not, but fascinating you know if this is what you do for a living i think it's a fascinating topic to explore and now he's calling out some of the um, heritage auction original art strips i think this stuff's interesting at one point this was going to be published by idw uh, i don't believe that's the case anymore but you see a lot of reference to some of idw's uh reprint projects of things like rip kirby that you know he would have been referencing and getting access to and very welcoming um there's a reprint of Heart of Juliet Jones referenced in Glamour Puss and how, and Dave Sims, like, that's the thing I was most looking forward to, you know, and whenever strips started to be reprinted, that was the strip I most wanted. So um, that's obviously a big influence on this whole work is having access to those. And he cites different things like um, there's a, a piece in the second volume of Rip Kirby where Sim postulates that uh, Raymond is auditioning to do this Gone with the Wind comic, The Heart of Juliet Jones, and 13 of the 19 panels in this one uh, storyline are silent. And so they're sort of like these vistas and landscapes to, to demonstrate what he could do, uh, you know, with that kind of a setting. Um, I have no idea if any of that's truth, you know, but it's, it's really fun to just look at this stuff. It's a new way to look at Rip Kirby if you're a Rip Kirby fan, or if you're new to it, it might be a reason to get into it and give it a look, uh, having some of this stuff pulled out. So... Um, Howard Chaikin, you know, uh, intro for one of these volumes of Rip Kirby. We talked to him a lot about illustration, American illustration. I would be very curious to see his reaction to a book like this. Yeah. Where so many artists are referenced and connected. First volume of, uh, of Terry and the Pirates, uh, Chaikin did, did the introduction to that. So he's very well schooled in all of the, the, the trinity of early schools. And this kind of collection in the back showcases virtually what we were seeing in you know in the bulk of this at least the, this volume where you're seeing the noir style that's referenced early on as being a you know brush influence and tearing the pirates influence but also seeing like these nightingale patterns of line work as he goes along flash gordon of course where alex raymond started both reprints and original art of that available and uh biographies of Dave Sim and Carson Grubaugh for, you know, it's a book. It's what happens in the back of the book. <laughs> so that is uh, volume one. Um, they're actually just going to do the whole complete book coming out later this year. It's The Strange Death of Alex Raymond, Dave Sim and Carson Grubaugh. I've never seen a comic like this. I've never read or experienced a story like this. It's a weird one, for sure. Yeah, I mean, it, it, for me, it's it, it's hard, it's hard to call it a story. It's like these little dissections of comic book minutia, but that's kind of the Cartoon Escape Hame channel, so it spoke kind of directly to me in that way. It, it definitely lines up in that regard. Yeah. What do you say, Jim? 
that's all I have for it, Ed. It's, uh, it's a weird one. It's one of the weirder comics I've ever... I remember first getting Glamour Plus issues, mm -hmm. and I would tell you about them, or I'd tell right. whoever about them, and be like, this is the weirdest thing I've ever read. Uh, the, book, the book just continues that direction. For sure. For sure. Uh, and, you know, I'm going to continue reading. Like I said, I'm up, up to the John Cullen Murphy piece, man, so I got to get out of here. Get back to reading the comic, man. Kayfabers, like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit the bell. We'll notify you when new vids are available. Jim, what's out there? Join me on Patreon.com slash Jim Rugg, where you can see my own version of making weird comics and drawings and books and mini comics and all of that good stuff. You can download my out-of-print mini comics and zines there. You can see my original art there. Patreon.com slash Jim Rugg. Red Room Comics are going to be hitting the stands, or actually have hit the stands this past Wednesday, I think. Or no, next, next Wednesday. Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> it's all immaterial because you're watching this whenever you're watching this. Exactly. Anyhow, they're out there in the wild and there are over 100,000 of these things in print at this very moment, which is fantastic to me. Got to thank you, Jim. Got to thank Peach. Got to thank the Kayfabe audience exactly. out there for showing up in a big, bad way. Get it put on your pull list. Every single issue is completely self-contained. So if you see one in the wild, there's a lot of them out there now. Uh, give it a shot. Check it out if you want to read the comics uh, ahead of time uh, or before your purchase. Uh, hit my Patreon up, uh, patreon.com slash edpiscor. There are three issues up there as we speak. Put out new strips every Tuesday, and it'll always uh, come out on the Patreon before it hits the print edition. You can subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the links below this video to keep up with everything we have going on in a very busy 2021. What are you working on, Jim? <laughs> you can find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts and merchandise at the links below this video as well. Kayfabe, I'm trying. I really <laughs> am, man. Jimmy, give one less set of merchandise, man. We're going to be on our way. Make more comics.